guys, me and Buster Green here with another episode of the best episode ever. Now today we have one of those ones that just been boiling along in the back of my head for a couple of years now. This is one of the episodes I wanted to do first when I first did the series. And today we are covering Kamen Rider. The first Kamen Rider. Not the movie Kamen Rider the first, although I'll touch on that a little. The actual first Kamen Rider series. Originally created by the Stanley of Japan, the man who created most of the best Japanese superheroes, Shotaro Ashinomori. Ashinomori originally started working with anime creator number one, Osama Tezuku, as his assistant. If Tezuka is the first god creator of all anime, then by all accounts you can consider Ashinomori the second. He helped work with Tezuka on Astro Boy, and then broke out on his own, creating the very successful anime Cyborg 009. Ishinomori created a bunch of crazy different characters throughout his career. And randomly, one fine day in the 1970s, he created a one-and-done manga called The Skull Man, about a jaded goth edgelord character who ran around in a skull helmet in a big red cape, riding on a motorcycle, crushing people to death with his OP Mewtwo psychic powers. The Skull Man was literally just an edgelord serial killer character that Ishinomori made to scare people, but somehow it was his breakout hit. Japanese TV demanded a TV show based on it, and so they started building an adaptation of it. Now, in some crazy alternate universe, we have a million spin-offs of Skull Rider, but early on in the production, TV executives decided that the Skull Man character himself was just way too scary for a fun TV show that kids might watch, at least for the 1970s. And apparently in live action, the costume looked creepy as hell. So, the show would only be greenlit if Ichinomori completely redesigned the character to be more kid-friendly and happy-looking. Now, at this time, Ishinomori happened to have a baby, and he looked at this baby and asked, Hey baby, what do you like? And so the baby said, I like bugs. And thus, the first Kamen Rider was born. Now, since I have always known of Kamen Rider, I could always identify Kamen Rider at a distance, and I always knew who Kamen Rider was. However, despite that, I only finally got around to watching the original 1970 Kamen Rider, I want to say about four years ago, when it first became available for streaming legally in the United States, thanks to Shop Factory. Now, despite that, I obviously didn't watch the first Kamen Rider as my first Kamen Rider series. Excluding the abomination of the Mass Rider on Fox Kids, my first proper Rider series that I sat down to watch was V3, which is quite confusing because it is the immediate follow-up to the original Kamen Rider. It starts with the first and second Kamen Rider dying in a terrible related explosion. And then I saw this one as a kid. I saw it all the way through. It was pretty all right. It was good enough that I watched every episode, but not strong enough that it left a huge impression on me. Anyway, so after V3, I watched a few of the other Rider series. Amazon was very thought provoking. I love Black for its tone. Black RX was the sequel to Black. And I also watched W as soon as it came out, because W was really cool. I also watched Ichiko back to back with either right before or right after I watched Fies. I remember finding Fies very dark and interesting, but as cool as Fies was, I actually got into the original series more because it just had better plots than Fies did. Also, I was in a big common Rider kick at this point because I was trying to watch Decade, but because Decade was a massive multi-series crossover, I wanted to watch as many of the older series before I got to Decade. So yeah, I was just watching Kamen Rider like crazy at that point in my life. So let's talk about the first Kamen Rider again because this year, 2021, is the 50th anniversary of Kamen Rider, the original Kamen Rider. And coincidentally, original Kamen Rider fan to the extreme, Hideaki Anno is about to release his movie remake of the original Kamen Rider, Shin Kamen Rider. Now, I am very, very intrigued at what his Shin Kamen Rider will be. And please don't confuse his Shin Kamen Rider with Kamen Rider Shin, which was just an ugly Kamen Rider from the 90s. I am ultimately very tantalized that Shin Kamen Rider might very, very intensely adapt the premise of the original Kamen Rider. The original Kamen Rider premise is actually very hardcore, and the original Kamen Rider premise is somehow the Kamen Rider premise that is most realistic and grounded to the real world. If I were to describe to you any of the other Kamen Rider series, the first Kamen Rider series is the only one that you could believe because it is based on real world events. There are no crazy alternate dimensions. There's no hundred year old, ancient civilizations with their own common Riders. 
There's no God King Kamen Riders. There's no thousand year old motorcycle of the God King Kamen Rider. There's no five gigabyte USB memory sticks that power up the Kamen Rider. The original Kamen Rider takes place in 1971. It is 26 years after the end of World War II, the fall of the Third Reich. And there we have Shocker, the abominable secret society Shocker. Days after Hitler's suicide, but before the final defeat of Nazi Germany, Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels, in one of his final official acts, establishes the werewolf program, a system wherein loyal citizens of Germany, loyal to Adolf Hitler, would become sleeper agents and reactivate to the great cause of the Third Reich, the great battle of the Second World War, randomly at any opportune moment, literal werewolves who would kill in Hitler's name under the light of the full moon. This was the inspiration for Hydra in the MCU, and this is the inspiration for Shocker. Shocker is founded as a werewolf unit located exclusively in Japan. Considering Japan's role as Germany's chief ally number one, even to this day there are outlier Japanese who identify as Nazis. They want to kill Jews, they want to kill anyone with dark skin, and tying into real life harder than that is famed Nazi scientist Joseph Mengele, Hitler's personal mad scientist, obsessed with genetic and DNA research who had famously escaped from capture by the Israeli Mossad not once but twice throughout the 1950s and 1960s. Dr. Mengele's background in genetic research was the inspiration for the novel The Boys from Brazil that would come out speculating on his work only a few years after this, considering that Mengele was at that time in an active operation to mass produce clones of Adolf Hitler. It was the 1970s. Enough time had passed that they were seeing the first major public resurgences of neo-Nazis. And it is in this environment that Shocker rises to power in Japan, delving into its own immoral genetic research, the creation of Kaijin, in English, monster humans. So to sum it all up, it's 1970, baby. We have Shocker, a Japanese Nazi sleeper cell unit with the trained goal of Adolf Hitler's plan of world domination and the genetic cleansing of the earth. As they grow in power and prowess, behind the scenes in the streets of Japan, they start kidnapping random strangers to genetically transform them into a widely built army of monstrous subhumans, again for their singular goal of world domination. So Shocker kidnaps people left and right from every single part of Japan. They transform a wide variety of everyday random people into kaijin with their goal of building a monster army to take over the world. Now the kaijin in this series are depicted as men wearing suits. But when you think of it, that's actually realistically because they're real human beings that have been trapped in these fucking monster suits. Like you ever see the movie Tusk? The guy in Tusk, that's a kaijin. When you consider it all like that, this is the most terrifying and realistic premise a common Rider series is ever going to have. So one fine day, a chemistry student by the name of Takeshi Hongo is captured by Shocker. But Takeshi Hongo is a smarter than average victim, having an abnormal above average IQ of 600 and something goes completely wrong. As they're in the process of turning Takeshi Hongo into a cyborg grasshopper, the scientist in charge of erasing Takeshi Hongo's mind, who is also a kidnapped victim, has decided to secretly allow Hongo to retain his memories because he knows that Hongo, with his vast above average intelligence, will become a violent yet responsible ally of justice, an enemy to Shocker, and quite frankly, he's had enough. So he's gonna let Takeshi Hongo go. He allows everything to go wrong. He allows the machine to freeze to short circuit. And thus the mass production cyborg hopper malfunctions and becomes the first common rider. Now, to figure out the best episode of Common Rider, Common Rider has 98 episodes. It is definitely a long and heavy show. Common Rider also has four main story arcs, although in Common Rider's case, they're not really story arcs, they're more or less just eras the show went through as the times changed and the show changed. So to start off with, we have the first Takeshi Hondo arc. That's the first 13 episodes. Now, a lot of people consider the best episode of Kamen Rider to be within these first 12. 
Some people, like Hideki Anno in fact, consider the best episode of Kamen Rider to be one of the first four because the early episodes of Kamen Rider have this intense horror movie quality. The kaijin in the first batch of episodes are all like these super murderous, super monsters that are designed to be just scary for the children of the 1970s. And if you've gone around to seeing the slightly better than average okay movie Kamen Rider the first, Kamen Rider the first is a 2009 era low budget remake of those first four episodes. Although it puts way too much focus on the kaijin in my opinion, and not enough focus on Kamen Rider and his fight against them. Now, unfortunately, Kamen Rider Ichigo's actor, Sega Saturn lover Hiroshi Fujioka, who I must note at this point is near 90 years old to this day, he could probably still kick your ass blindfolded though, because he's one of those like weird actors like, I don't know, William Shatner who's like barely aged since he turned 50. Anyway, Hiroshi Fujioka, such a Chad badass that he insisted on doing all his own stunts. Unfortunately, by the time of the 12th episode, something went wrong. A major accident occurred, and one day while he was doing a bike stunt, Fujioka's leg collided directly with a pole and was completely shattered. As a result, he ended up being hospitalized for almost an entire year. Now, during this year that Hiroshi Fujioka was hospitalized, the show went into its second arc where it had to just straight up replace him. So, forced with this situation, the Hayato Ichimanji arc started. The premise here is that freelance photographer Hayato Ichimanji was also captured and turned into a Kamen Rider by Shocker. He was turned into an improved Kamen Rider, Kamen Rider number two, in an attempt to kill Kamen Rider number one. But unfortunately, as this was all going on, Kamen Rider 1, who was quite the intelligent guy, found out about it and therefore showed up just before Ichimanji was brainwashed, beat up all the people trying to brainwash him, and then suddenly there were two Kamen Rider. And on top of that, Kamen Rider 1, being satisfied that now there were two of them, decided to go overseas to fight all the other neo-Nazi groups while Kamen Rider 2 slipped comfortably into Kamen Rider number 1's life. Now that's a lot of hoops to go through to justify a hospitalization, but by god they made it work. Fujioka spent the next nine months in the hospital, which was again almost a whole damn year, and in that year, Kamen Rider survived because it was popular as hell. So meanwhile, Hayato Ichimanji had 40 successful episodes as Kamen Rider number 2, until episode 53 where a finally resuscitated Takeshi Hongo returned as Kamen Rider. Now, when Kamen Rider came, 1 came back, Hayato Ichimanji got dissed and dismissed and sent off to fight Shocker in Africa. And then we have the third era of Kamen Rider, the Takeshi Hongo Returns arc, consisting of another 40-something episodes. Of course, a lot of people had gotten used to Ichimanji being Kamen Rider for, for much longer than Hongo was, so finally, after a lot of protesting, the final arc slash status quo change occurs. Shocker is seemingly defeated by Kamen Rider number one, but in an absolute desperation move, they undergo a corporate merger with another neo-Nazi werewolf organization from Africa named Geldan. And suddenly this reopens the doors for a new and improved Gel Shocker, with the added gimmick of making even more unstable kaijin out of humans who are now mutated with the DNA from two animals instead of one animal. So to combat this new threat, Hayato Ichimanji comes back for the last 18 episodes of Kamen Rider, and both Kamen Riders work together as the Super Kamen Rider Brothers, and they kick Nazi butt together so hard every day to save Japan. Now, unfortunately, if I'm being real, almost every single episode of Kamen Rider has the same cookie cutter plot. And I mean that this does not only apply to every single episode of Kamen Rider, the original, but it also applies to several of the sequels, several of the spin-offs, and several other shows made by the same cast and crew. Basically, what happens in every episode is a kaijin shows up, a kaijin commits a crime, gasp, the kaijin is so awful, Kamen Rider is meanwhile jerking off somewhere with Tachibana Tobe, Kamen Rider gets wise to the kaijin committing a second crime based on the first one, so Kamen Rider confronts the kaijin, a bunch of foot soldiers come out and fight Kamen Rider, he transforms, and then the monster and Kamen Rider kick each other over and over again in a rock quarry until one of them explodes. Rinse and repeat for 50 years. Now, there is one special episode of the original Kamen Rider that does not follow this formula. 
and that episode is my favorite. Now, the episode of Kamen Rider that does not follow the formula is Kamen Rider Saves Christmas. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Although, Kamen Rider Saves Christmas does have a banging fucking song about how Kamen Rider saves Santa Claus. Anyway, so aside from Kamen Rider Saves Christmas, there is one significant off-formula episode. Now, remember Shotaro Shinomori, the genius mangaka who created Kamen Rider, Power Rangers, Kikaida, all the really cool Japanese superheroes? So since Kamen Rider was doing so well, through some sort of freak miracle, they went to Ishinomori and gave him a one-time chance to direct and write a single episode. Now, as far as I know, this is the only time this ever happened, although they did bring him back to help direct the last episode of Kamen Rider Stronger and also the Sky Rider movie, Eight Riders vs. the Galaxy Game. But I haven't seen either of those, so I don't know about them yet. Right now, all I know is that before Kamen Rider ended, he was given one chance to direct episode 84 of Kamen Rider. Rider in Peril, the hell trap of an enemy jaguar. And this, my friends, is what I consider the best standalone episode of Kamen Rider, because it stands out from all the others by not following the formula of all the other episodes. It's almost like Ishinomori had been watching the show for the past two years and just felt like, you know what? You're doing it wrong. So on top of that, this is the only time Ishinomori ever directed a TV episode of Kamen Rider, and I personally think that he knocked it out of the park. So, episode 84 starts with some heavy helicopter footage of Japan. The narrator chimes in and reminds the audience that Gel Shocker is a secret society hiding literally anywhere. At this time, Gel Shocker is run by General Black, and all they care about is killing Kamen Rider. So after the title card, we do a hard cut to a disgusting close-up of a bloodshot eyeball. It pans back to reveal the, the tired eyes of a middle-aged man, shot in dramatic blue and pink lighting. It is revealed to be General Black, and also from this close-up I can tell he's missing like half his teeth. He reminds the Anenime Jaguar that his only purpose in life is to kill Kamen Rider, that he's a killing machine, and that killing Kamen Rider is the only thing that will make him feel pleasure because he's been sterilized. General Black fades away into space and we get a perfect transition, a smooth fade from General Black to this man completely dressed in black, struggling to walk out of a raging ocean. As he slowly marches out of the sea, we hear General Black's screaming voice, again ordering him to kill louder and louder and the man has a breakdown. We get these super artistic shots of this man swearing into the ocean that he will never kill anyone. And the man begs the voice to stop screaming at him, but the voice just gets louder and louder again, repeating over and over again, kill, you have to kill. And then the man reveals that he's not a human being anymore. He has been reconstituted by Gel Shocker into a cyborg kaijin, a Nenime Jaguar. And so this man screams and he transforms into this killing monster, all human rationality gone. And suddenly at this moment, a fisherman sees him. He sees the anatomy jaguar. And the anatomy jaguar darts at this fisherman with the speed that only a jaguar can have and sprays him with the acid that only a sea anatomy can have, melting the man to death until only his feet are left. And then his feet get washed out the sea by the churning waves as this monster marches off towards Tokyo, set with its single mission to kill Kamen Rider. Hard cut to Kamen Rider's sexy girlfriends. Now, I completely forgot about all these ladies, but he dated a lot of them all at once. He even dated Lyndon Matsumoto. Now, the cute one is named Choko, and her friend is Maki Katsuragi. They're trying to find Maki's father. Now, meanwhile, Taki, the FBI agent assisting Kamen Rider in a fight against evil, shows up to meet them, and he says that, holy shit, this is awful. He's going to use the Kamen Rider Kids Club to start searching for them. But just as he says that, an army of gel shocker soldiers on Tarzan ropes swing down from the trees above them. Taki takes down a few of them, but they keep using the ropes to mess him up, and they do all these hit and run attacks on Taki, and the gel shocker soldiers end up breaking Taki's jaw. Then all of a sudden, Anami Jaguar shows up in his Anami Jaguar mobile, and he drives off with Mackie, who he's knocked unconscious. Now, there is another high-concept art scene of all these sirens growing off while all these crows fly through the air, 
and we do a hard cut to Tachi Tobe, Common Rider's best friend and butler, and the Common Rider girlfriends all at the Common Rider Kids Club, mobilizing their network of private investigators slash children to try and track down Anami Jaguar in his Anami Jaguar mobile and find Mackie. Children literally all over Japan go into panic as they are quickly informed via radio and carrier pigeon about this kidnapping, and they start going on patrol all over Japan with their bicycles. Omnis jaws like music plays, and since everyone's hearing all about this on the radio, Takashi Hongo picks up the transmission and agrees that he's going to get involved and start searching himself. Meanwhile, Taki is still searching in the FBI helicopter with his bandage up jaw. Unfortunately, despite being very dramatic as he flies a helicopter around Japan, he completely fails. The extremely obvious Anami Jaguar mobile is finally spotted by a random Kamen Rider Kid Club member on his bicycle as it drives through Chiba. Taki curses about this because he's apparently been going the wrong way this entire time, but meanwhile, Hongo on his motorcycle figures out where Chiba is and we get another dramatic montage of Hongo just driving his motorcycle at absolute super speed through all these different prefectures in Japan until finally he catches up to the Anami Jaguar mobile. Now triumphant music plays and we get a super long shot of Hongo closing in on the Anami Jaguar mobile. Now Anami Jaguar at this part point starts being super evil and going off on his evil villain monologue. Now he laughs that Hongo is chasing him, and he reveals that it is incredibly stupid that an enemy Jaguar has an enemy Jaguar mobile. Like, did anyone else notice that I've been talking for five minutes about this enemy Jaguar mobile and how stupid it is? Well, that's part of an enemy Jaguar's stupid fucking plan, because his plan was that he was going to lure Kamen Rider with this ridiculous car into an obvious trap. Now, despite the fact that it's a trap, Hongo is really struggling to catch up to this ridiculous car. So he finally has no choice but to transform into Kamen Rider, because when he's transformed into Kamen Rider, his motorcycle transforms into the Cyclone, and it can go at super speeds. So the Cyclone comes out, it's going at super speeds, and it finally catches up to an enemy Jaguar in a rock quarry. Now, as anyone who likes the show knows, the rock quarry is where all the shit goes down. So yeah, of course, Shocker shows up and they start carpet bombing the rock quarry. Of course, Common Rider is Common Rider and he can easily jump his bike over any of the explosions in the rock quarry because there are jumps in front of all the explosions. But it's not over yet because suddenly an army of gel shocker soldiers show up to fight Common Rider. But in this episode, they're all riding motorcycles and he can see them coming down the highway and they look formidable as hell. And in something that you will never see in any other episode, there's this slow and subtle scene where Kamen Rider just stares them down and sizes them up and is like, you want a piece? So anyway, the Gel Shocker motorbike gang comes out and they run all these psychedelic soldiers around Kamen Rider. They manage to tie him up with their Tarzan ropes and it doesn't seem like it's going to go that great. So Kamen Rider just flies up into the air, slams all the Gel Shockers together in such a way that they explode upon contact with each other. And suddenly, Kamen Rider gets sworn from all angles with these tentacles. Now, an enemy Jaguar comes out of nowhere with the still unconscious Mackie and describes his intense urge to fight Kamen Rider. Kamen Rider demands that he hand over Mackie, but he escapes and with his ability to travel at high speeds like a Jaguar and turn invisible like an enemy, he like runs circles around Kamen Rider by just constantly turning invisible and like traveling over like vast parts of land while he's invisible. Now he suddenly returns to Brawl of Kamen Rider after putting Maki somewhere and then he sprays Kamen Rider with his anatomy acid but Rider dodges it way too easily. So he turns invisible again and then ensnares Kamen Rider with his tentacles. Now Kamen Rider is completely like caught up in these tentacles. Anemi Jaguar tries to strangle, beat Kamen Rider to death, hang him from the tentacles. There's just intense brutality coming out of these tentacles. So suddenly Kamen Rider does a rider kick and he kicks an enemy Jaguar straight in the heart. And then things get really psychedelic again. We see all these waves crashing into the ocean and one of the waves drops off this like broken baby Cupid doll with like a single leg that washes up on the beach. And there's this like really weird, extremely slow focus pan on it. 
Anyway, so Taki's helicopter is just now arriving at Shiba where the battle is happening. And he finds the suddenly now irrelevant Anami Jaguar mobile. So he lands his helicopter, he runs over to investigate it, and surprisingly he finds Mackie still asleep in the back seat. Meanwhile, back at the shore, Kamen Rider has been defeated and turned back into Keshi Kongo, and he doesn't look very great since Anami Jaguar just nearly killed him. Now, in a completely confusing twist, Hongo finds Mackie also at the beach, lying unconscious in front of him on a rock. And, uh, this isn't good. This is actually the trap. So, anyway, meanwhile, Taki and the real Maki are flying over in their helicopter, screaming at Hongo to tell him that it's a trap, but he doesn't notice. So, at the same time, Maki spots her father crawling out of the ocean looking totally insane. And the Maki on the beach is actually a freaking blow-up doll filled with napalm. And it explodes, showering Takeshi Hongo in fire. Holy fucking shit. A 40-foot plume of napalm goes up over this beach. And because this is 1971, they actually detonated a napalm bomb on this beach. Anyway, so Taki thinks Hongo surely died in this napalm explosion. But actually, at the last second, he turned into Kamen Rider and flew up and caught onto the helicopter. Now, everyone is telling Kamen Rider to rescue Maki's father, who is also on the beach. But at that moment, Taki's father is just sitting on the rocks, cursing out Kamen Rider. He's like, fuck you, Kamen Rider. How dare you not be blown up by a bomb? Fuck you. Ah, blah, 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 blah. He's just going on and on about this. Anyway, so he turns back into an enemy jaguar, horrifying Maki. And Kamen Rider realizes that he transformed using a henshin device inside his head. So Kamen Rider theorizes that if he kicks him in the head, it might just stop him from turning into a kaiju again. So he does one final rider kick to an enemy Jagger's head, and I guess that broke the henshin device. So Kamen Rider and an enemy Jaguar spur off again for seemingly what seems to be a final confrontation. But Mackie finally runs out of the helicopter and just starts screaming at her father like nonstop. An enemy Jaguar recognizes Mackie and then he starts glitching out and he starts like hearing his daughter's voice he hears the programming from general black and finally he detransforms back into a normal human being and gets and just collapses into the mud he gets back up at this point but seeing his daughter and talking to his daughter finally calms him down and turns him back into a normal guy and that's the end of the episode by all accounts, this man has been saved by Common Rider and his daughter, and they live a normal life after that. Now, there's some narration after the fact that Shocker is so fucked up that they would, like, rip a family apart, and that's pretty par for the course in uh, Common Rider. Every episode, the narrator's just all like, Shocker fucking sucks. You know who wrecked your breakfast? It was Shocker. Anyway, you might ask yourself why I picked this episode, other than the fact that it was kind of an art house episode done by Shinwar himself. Well, one amazing fact about this episode is that this episode is the only episode of Common Rider set in real time. It takes place in the span of 21 minutes, and by all accounts, that was 21 real minutes. Everything in this episode played out in real time, except with the possible exception of, like, the search party. Now, apart from that, half this episode is kind of wasted on helicopter scenes, but this is the only episode in the entirety of the original Kamen Rider series that focuses on the fact that aside from Kamen Rider himself, all the other kaijin are also transformed human. Like, if you saw the movie Kamen Rider the first, that also focuses on this. But that movie wastes a ridiculous amount of time, like two hour runtime, on the fact that kaijin used to be humans and it does it in such an unsuccessful and sappy way that it ruins the movie. But this episode, with just a few well-executed scenes, perfectly communicates the existential horror of the fact that other than Kamen Rider, hundreds of people were turned into kaijin. Like, we don't know how many people were weaponized by the Nazis, but you have to assume that even though Kamen Rider killed a monster every week, that monster he killed every week was a real person. They had lives before that. They had families, they had people who will miss them and who will spend the rest of their lives just not knowing what happened to their dad and not knowing that he was turned into fucking sea man a man and then fucking common writer kicked him to death. Not to mention the additional depressing fact that all these kaijin have been sterilized during the transformations, 
because you can't have Horsefly Gomez over here going off trying to put his maggots into like the young virgins of Japan. So yeah, this is the most impactful Common Rider episode because it's the only one that brings it down to earth and like makes it clear that this is a show about Nazis turning people into monsters. On top of that, Ashinomori used the Shocker Foot Soldiers in a very clever, completely different way from the typical Kamen Rider episode, where they just surround Kamen Rider in a circle and then take turns doing backflips over him. In this episode, they're actually put off as threatening and slightly well coordinated, and Kamen Rider actually has to think about them, and Taki gets his fucking jaw broken by them. The biggest twist in this episode, though, is that Kamen Rider actually manages to save someone. Like, remember the bad Josh Whedon Justice League movie where Batman was uh, just, just save someone? By reuniting Mackie with her dad and destroying the henshin device in his head, they saved a man. They seemingly saved an entire family because I think Mackie's dad was like the only income earner in their family. Like, it's really amazing to see Kamen Rider not just kill a monster, but to save the human being inside the monster costume. This is the only time he ever did that without it being a setup to create another Kamen Rider. So that's why I think this is the best episode. Because this is what Kamen Rider should have been about. And I feel like, if anything, all the other episodes were missed opportunities to take it this seriously. Anyway, what do you guys think? Do you guys disagree with me? Do you like the stupider episodes? Try to change my mind. I'm open. Leave a comment. Anyway, do you guys want me to cover more Common Rider series? I haven't watched all of them, but I think at this point I've maybe watched like half of them. Like half the Showa series, half the Modern series. I'm also really super looking forward to what Hideaki Anno does with Shin Common Rider, because quite frankly, this episode here represents the best of what Common Rider can be. And I think Hideaki Anno, he's gonna go for that too. Like, if Hideaki Anno goes very dark and neo-Nazi like I'm hoping, I think Shin Kamen Rider is going to be the best Kamen Rider movie ever made. But I'm also looking forward to Fudo Detectives because I love Kamen Rider W, and I think right now that was one of the best modern Rider shows. So, anyway, thank you guys. I was Moon Buster Green. Sometimes I talk about Kamen Rider. Please subscribe to me. I will get monetized if I get 280 more subscribers. So, thank you guys. Thank you everyone who's been with me up till now. We are getting there. All right, I need to go get dinner. Thank you, I'm out. Bye.